I got slightly diverted by the beginning of Jim Vopel's talk when he got to number two and old men were devising secret ways of living longer and they sounded like alternatives. Severe dietary restriction, red wine, tomatoes for breakfast, or sex with virgins. Now, if you had your choice, <laughs> which would you choose? But then I was thinking, we're in Sweden. Gender equity. Now, this was clearly a recipe devised by old men, but in Sweden, with gender equity, the virgins would have to have sex with virgins. So I'm afraid the old men will have to make do with tomatoes for breakfast. <laughs> The Forte, the new research funding organisation, uh, is going to fund research on work, on welfare and on health. What I do is link work, welfare and other social determinants with health. This is a research funding organisation and as I was saying to colleagues last night, what I've done my whole life is research. But at some point, I asked the question, what if somebody took the research seriously? Was I just doing pure research? Well, in fact, in Britain, I was doing pure research because we had a Conservative government under Margaret Thatcher and John Major, and Margaret Thatcher said there are no inequalities in society because there's no such thing as society. So doing work on how society impacts on health and health inequalities was pure research because clearly no one was ever going to take it seriously. And then the government changed and yesterday's pure research became today's applied research. When the government changed again from a Labour government to a Conservative-led government, we worried that it would go back to health inequalities being a matter of pure research, but it was not the case. The Conservative-led, a right, centre-right coalition government in Britain said that reduction of health inequalities has to be at the centre of our public health strategy. And I say this in Sweden because I think it's very important that policies on social determinants and health equity should not be for governments only of the left. They should also be of governments of whatever complexion. Because we're talking about avoidable ill health for the whole population. And shouldn't that be a major priority for all governments? And with that in mind, trying to use the best evidence to impact on policy and practice, I chaired three reviews. The first was, as you said in your introduction, it was Swedish, but I recognise Commission on Social Determinants of Health, it was the WHO Commission. We published our report in 2008, closing the gap in a generation. And when I hobbled into Stockholm last January, a year and a bit ago, hobbled because I had a bicycle accident and fractured my femur and I hobbled into Stockholm and a member of the Swedish parliament said most commission reports sink without trace within a few weeks of their publication. Your report, he said, is still being discussed in the Swedish parliament five years later. And in fact, he invited me to attend the social committee of the Swedish parliament next time I came and not being a diplomat or a politician, I was sufficiently lacking in diplomatic skills to say that I was delighted they were still discussing it. It would be even better if they did something about it, but uh, <laughs> that's a different question. We made a virtue of necessity. The Global Commission report was trying to cover the whole world, Sub-Saharan Africa, Latin America, South Asia, East Asia, North America, Europe, everywhere. We said that recommendations on education for Gujarat in India can't be the same as in Scotland. Therefore, it was important that countries take it on board and work out what this means in their own context. And in Britain, the government 
invited me to conduct a review, which I called Fair Society, Healthy Lives. It was a statement that if we put fairness at the heart of all policy making, health would improve and health inequalities would diminish. And as I said in my introductory comment, it was commissioned by a Labour government, but adopted as policy by a Conservative-led coalition government. What they're doing about it is another question, but we'll get to that. And then Susanne Jakob, the director of the European Office of the World Health Organization, invited me to conduct this European review of social determinants and the health divide, and we launched that in London in October of last year. These were the kinds of figures that we had for the European review. Life expectancy in the Russian Federation uh, for men was 63. You may be wondering why Israel is in the European region of WHO. If it weren't in the European region, it would have to be in the Eastern Mediterranean region. Now you know why it's in the European region. Um, you can see a 17-year gap in male life expectancy across Europe. Iceland just ahead of Sweden, uh, but Sweden's right up there. A similar gap for women, but smaller. And most of the health inequalities we see, we see the same pattern in women as in men, but in general, the gaps are smaller. And we pointed out that even in Sweden, there are inequalities in health and increasing inequalities in health. This is life expectancy at age 25 by education, sorry, it's not labeled. The bottom graph is people of low education, the bottom line, and you can see life expectancy is improving for everybody, but it's improving a little faster the more education you have. So the gap is getting bigger. It's great that health's improving for everybody, but a major challenge, which of course is why colleagues in Sweden are concerned about these issues. And in the Russian Federation, life expectancy, I'm looking at a demographer, I don't think I can mouth the words 20Q45, but Jim will explain to me what that is afterwards. The possibility of a 20-year-old living to 65 uh, is going up in Russia for people with university education and going down for people with primary education. So an enormous increase. So we said there are two major challenges in the European region. The huge health, health inequalities across the region, Russia, Kazakhstan at one end, Sweden, Iceland, Israel at the other end, and the major inequalities within countries, which in many cases are increasing. And this was the approach we took to the European Review. Four major areas of recommendations, life course stages, the wider society, the macro level context, and the importance of systems. Let me come back to the English Review, which in a way was a precursor to the European one. And I said, we gave it the title we did because it was a statement that we should put fairness at the heart of all policy making. The government in Britain uses the word fairness as if it has no meaning at all. They use it as a label that you affix retrospectively to whatever policy you were going to pursue for whatever reason. So you reduce the top rate of tax and you call it fair. You close sure start centres for young children and you call it fair. You reduce the level of tax credits to the poor and you call it fair. I've debated with our politicians and said, I use fairness in a technical sense. I'm a doctor. I'm concerned about health. And the systematic inequalities in health between social groups that are judged to be avoidable by reasonable means and are not avoided are unfair. Therefore, any policies that retard progress toward reduction of these avoidable health inequalities are unfair. I was saying to people in England recently that 
this was my song, this graph. And if you go and watch Liverpool Football Club play, you don't say, oh, they're singing that song again. Uh, they say, no, you'll never walk alone. You say, wow, that's our song. Well, this is my song. This is the gradient. And it was figure one of our English review. It was in the European review. It was in the commission in a different form. Each of these dots represents a neighborhood, a small area of England, classified by the level of income deprivation. So as you look at it, to your right is the most affluent areas, and the top graph is life expectancy. And what you can see is that people near the top have shorter life expectancy than those at the top. People in the middle have shorter life expectancy than those near the top. It's a gradient all the way from top to bottom. The bottom graph is disability-free life expectancy. The gradient's steeper, but it is a gradient. Now, the horizontal line, and this relates to what Jim Vopel was just talking about, the horizontal line represents retirement age. It has been 65. The previous government in Britain wanted to raise it to 68 by 2046. The present government wants to do that more quickly. So the top of that horizontal green line is 68. You can see that three quarters of the population do not have disability-free life expectancy as long as 68. If the effect of asking people to work to 68 was to move them off pensions onto disability benefits, you'd save no money. It would be a dubious social advance. And I've said to politicians, if you want people to work longer, you are going to have to take action to reduce the social gradient in disability-free life expectancy, and you can't do it by focusing only on the worst off. You've got to deal with the gradient. This is very difficult. When I talk about the gradient in Her Majesty's Treasury, and one senior economist said, oh, don't come to me with that Scandinavian nonsense. We're Anglo-Saxons. We focus on the worst off. I don't want to hear Swedish stuff about universal. What we learned from our Swedish colleagues was the importance of universalism, the importance of universal policies. And if you're going to deal with the gradient, you have to have a universalist approach. This is the gradient for different European countries. Not very well labelled. Uh, ISC education is the international classification of education. And zero to two is the low level, and five to six is the high level. It's a gradient, but I've left the middle levels off. Sweden, SE. There is a rumour going around that there's a Swedish paradox. The rumour is Sweden has all these wonderful social democratic policies, but it has huge life expectancy gap, huge inequalities in health. That's the rumour. I can't quite put my finger on it, but I'm not convinced. If you look at these European countries, Sweden has the longest life expectancy at age 25. The people with low education had just about the longest life expectancy at age 25, and the gap between them is pretty small. And there's another thing about this graph that you can see big variation, steepness in the slope of the gradient, but most of that is due to differences among the people with low education. There's another rumour going round that inequalities damage high-level people as well as low-level people. That's not what this looks like. The people with more education in Estonia aren't that different to the people with more education in Sweden. Estonia's at EE at the other end. But the people with low education in Estonia are at huge disadvantage compared to the people with low education in Sweden or Italy or Norway or Denmark or Finland. What a coincidence. There just happens to be Finland, Denmark, Norway, Sweden. 
up there with the worst off doing pretty well and therefore relatively narrow health inequalities. And the fact that we can get this huge variation in the gradient suggests we can do something about it and I would argue we know what to do. That's what these reviews that I conducted were about, getting the best evidence from the best experts around the world to tell us what works. And in the English case, we had six recommendations through the life course. The European one looked rather similar. And let me show you just a few examples. So give every child the best start in life and education and lifelong learning. This looks at the proportion of children who are read to daily at age three in England by parents' income level, or socioeconomic status, by quintiles. So it's not just that children in poor families are not being read to, but it's a social gradient. The higher the socioeconomic level of the family, the more likely are children aged three to be read to. Do you know what it does to read to a child age three? You interact with the child, you cuddle the child, you love the child. There's intellectual stimulation, there's tactile stimulation, emotional stimulation. And that could happen across the social gradient, but it's not happening. And the evidence shows apply universal services for preschool and you make a difference. And the difference is bigger the more deprived the family. You make less of a difference to the rich kids, they're already doing well, you make more of a difference to the poor kids. And look at mother suffered postnatal depression, goes the other way. The lower the status, the more likely that mother's suffering postnatal depression, and she's not going to feel like reading to the children. So we've said in looking at families, at early child development, you've got to look at children, you've got to look at parenting, you've got to look at the lives parents are leading because of the impact of the lives parents are leading on their ability to parent. And the lives they are leading is influenced by their economic and social circumstances. And if we look at gaps in school readiness at age three and five by family income, you can see the gradient. And conduct problems, already the gradient going the other way. And as I said, you can make a difference. Look at these data from Latin America. We've got two things plotted on the graph at the same time. One is the percent of children who are enrolled in preschool, age three to five, and the other is the reading in sixth grade in selected countries. So it's the percent of children in level four re with a high reading score. Cuba, nearly 100% of children are enrolled in preschool, and 100% of children are achieving the top reading grade. And then Costa Rica and Chile, close behind. But at the other end, Paraguay, Dominican Republic. I was in Peru recently, and they're challenged. Peru's growing rich quickly. But look what they have to achieve. They'll get as rich, they're richer than Cuba, but they're not doing as well on early child development. And enrollment in preschool makes a huge difference to education subsequently. Part of what we've been doing when we published the English Review is monitoring what's happened. Because monitoring's vital. Knowing what's going on is very helpful in galvanizing activity. So this is looking at the percent of children with a good level of development at age five when they start school by the level of deprivation of the local authority. So again, to the right, you've got the most affluent, to the left, the most deprived, and you see this straight line relation. The more affluent the local authority, the higher the proportion of children age five that are doing well. But there's variation around the line. 
for a given level of affluence and deprivation, some local authorities are doing much better than others. If you like, some of the Cubas and the Costa Ricans and some of the Paraguays. And we've got a fairly good grasp of why that is. So what this suggests to me is two strategies. One is good preschool services for young children, supporting parents, investing in high-skilled preschool education. And the second is reduced deprivation. Because if you move the more deprived local authorities up towards the middle, you'd have fewer children with poor early child development. The other thing is that the median was 56%. Only 56% of children in England were classified as having a good level of development. And I thought, this is appalling. Can it really be true? Well, if we look at international figures, country ranking on equality in child well-being, on material, education and health, there are the usual suspects up at the top. Denmark, Finland, Netherlands, Switzerland, all in the top ranking. Oh dear, Sweden is not in the top ranking. I've been asked, I've only been here for about 12 hours, but I've been asked three times, including by Swedish national radio, what should Sweden be doing to catch up to Finland? I said, give me another half a day and I'll tell you, I'll be an expert, I'll tell you. Austria, France, Germany, the UK's got to be here somewhere. Oh my God, we're down at rank five. Maybe that's real that only 56% of children have a good level of development. But I do like to lecture in the United States. <laughs> it's the only big country that makes me feel halfway decent about my own. <laughs> so I said there are two strategies. One is to improve services for preschool, and the second is to reduce poverty. This is from our European review. It lo it's looking at poverty where poverty is defined as less than 60% median income. So it's a relative measure for the country. So look at Sweden and look at Latvia. Before taxes and transfers, poverty levels in Latvia were 35%. 35% of children were in poverty. And in Sweden were 32%. After taxes and transfers, in Latvia, it was still 25% of child poverty, but in Sweden, it was down to 12%. In Slovenia, not a rich country, it was even lower. Clearly, in Sweden and Slovenia, you are intolerant of child poverty. You're slightly more tolerant of it than Norway is, but you're intolerant of child poverty. I was giving a lecture the opening session of the American Public Health Association. It was a room like this, except there were 7,000 people in it. It was vast. And I said, how's the US doing? So I showed them a graph. The US is doing worse than Latvia after taxes and transfers. And I said to them, you live in a democracy. This must be the level of child poverty that you want. If not, you would elect a government that did something different. And they all looked at me. And somebody said to me afterwards, do you think you'll be asked back? I said, well, <laughs> I've already ensured I won't be asked back to the Swedish parliament, so <laughs> I'm ticking up a trail of people I've offended. Create fair employment and good work for all. Early child development, do less well in school, low educational qualifications, and then leave school onto the scrap heap. Now, when in Greece, 60% of 18 to 24-year-olds are unemployed, in Spain, 56% of 18 to 24-year-olds are unemployed, in Portugal and Italy, it's 
you do see the social gradient by education, but it's a tsunami that's affecting everybody. In other countries where it's lower, you still see this social gradient. The lower the level of education, pre-primary, primary and lower secondary, the higher the unemployment in all of these countries. So it starts, you want to do something about youth unemployment, start before they go to school. But the general economic environment really matters. And unemployment's not very good for people. Some of our politicians, in Britain at least, think that unemployment is a lifestyle choice. When Starbucks advertises vacancies and 35 people apply for a job in Starbucks, clearly those 34 who didn't get the job have chosen unemployment as a lifestyle choice. In case this doesn't translate well, I'm being ironic. I'm being <laughs> ironic. Irony, you know, you got that. <laughs> in the 1980s economic downturn, when we had a huge increase in unemployment, colleagues of mine looked at the impact of unemployment on health. What we've got for people who were employed in 1981, the social gradient in mortality, and for people who are unemployed in 1981, for each social class, the unemployed had about a 20% higher mortality. At the time, a Minister of Finance in Britain said, if a rise in unemployment is the price we have to pay to keep inflation down, it's a price worth paying. And I wondered, would even a Minister of Finance say, if killing people is the price we have to pay to keep inflation down. It's a price worth paying. Because that's what government policy was doing. Government policy was killing people because government policy led to a rise in unemployment. And now what we've got is European policy made by the, whatever they call the troika of the European Commission and the IMF and the Central Bank, throwing young people in Athens and Madrid onto the scrap heap. And it's damaging them. What we see is not individuals for whole countries. A 1% rise in unemployment is associated with a 0.8% rise in suicide. So little do people like unemployment, they kill themselves and they kill each other. But the good news, traffic fatalities go down. Can't afford to take the car out, so that's great. And when people are in work, the quality of work really matters. We've been concerned with two issues at work, effort reward imbalance and low control. And you can see the lower the status, this is across Europe, the 12 European countries, the lower the status, the more likely are people at work to have imbalance between the amount of effort and the reward they get, and the more likely are they to tell us they have little control in the workplace. Uh, I'm going to run out of time, I'll move on. Healthy standard of living for all. What a radical recommendation. In a rich society, everybody ought to have the minimum necessary for a healthy life. We said that minimum income for healthy living includes not just food and shelter, but the ability to lead a life of dignity. I did something very unusual for somebody in my position, a professor in a medical school, I lectured to medical students. I know, it's a bit outlandish to do such a thing. Professors are not supposed to profess, but I did. To first year undergraduates, I got them two weeks after they started. And I said to them, you came to UCL because you wanted to learn about genomics and metabolomics and proteomics and something else omics. And I'm telling you, that if an older person 
can't have enough, doesn't have enough money to buy presents for her grandchildren, she can't have a healthy life because she can't lead a life of dignity. If your granny, I said to them, can't buy you a present, your granny cannot lead a life of dignity. You didn't think you were going to come, you were going to hear about the genome, not about granny buying presents. They loved it. But you've got to get them in their pre cynical phase before they do. <laughs> Sorry, clinical, <laughs> clinical. <laughs> if we look at who's poor in Britain, again, the political rhetoric is that people are poor because they're worthless. If they were decent people, they wouldn't be poor. We've gone back to Victorian times. We've gone back to the language of undeserving poverty. And there's an equation, hard-working families. All government policies are supposed to be about hard-working families. They should listen to Jim Vopel. What about people who want to smell the flowers? They're not allowed. They've got to be hard-working. They only have to work, what was it, 23 hours a week? That's, <laughs> that's what hard-working families... Well, it turns out, if you look at people in poverty, low income, of the 13 million people in the United Kingdom in poverty, 6.7 million are in households where at least one person is working. You look there, there are more people in poverty in working households than there are in non-working households. And in those working households in poverty, Three quarters of the adults are working. The problem is not fecklessness. The problem is not lack of desire to work. The problem is low pay. It's not their problem of lack of ability or willingness. The problem is they're not paid enough. Is there enough money? By golly, there's enough money. As Jim said, the challenge has been... I just was looking at figures this morning from this new book by Piketty. Between 2010 and 2012, more than 90% of the income growth in the United States went to the top 1%. Over that two-year period from 2010 to 2012, everybody below the top 1% got nothing. There's a lot of money about, but we're not giving it to these working people in low-paid jobs. And when the head of the President's Council of Economic Advisors in the White House talks about the Great Gatsby Curve, talks about the fact that if you look at the Gini coefficient of income inequality for a country against social mobility, you get this tight relation. What this figure is, the 0.5, is the correlation between parents' earning and earnings of their adult children. So if, for a country, the adult children earned exactly the same as the parents, the country would score one. If there's no relation between the earnings of the children and the earnings of the parent, the country would score zero, like close to what Denmark, Norway, and Finland do. In other words, in the US and the UK, if your parents are rich, it's overwhelmingly likely that you'll be rich. But that's not the case in Denmark, Norway, and Finland. It's a bit more the case in Sweden. So one of the problems with these big in income inequalities is it cuts off opportunities for the next generation. Scandalous. And when I talked about the rise of unemployment affecting suicide, we know that social protection helps. I told you I was going to link social protection, work and health. If there were no spending on social protection, a 3% rise in unemployment would be associated with about a 3% rise in suicide. In Eastern European countries, they spend about... $37 a head on social protection, and a 3% rise in unemployment is associated with a 2% rise in suicide. In Western European countries, we spend about $150 a head, and 
on social protection and a 3% rise in unemployment is associated with a less than 1% rise in suicide. So the level of social protection really matters. I mentioned that a member of the Swedish parliament said these reports commonly get forgotten, your report still being discussed. I said that in Britain my report was at least in principle adopted by the government, but in practice there's been enthusiastic take-up by local authorities. The King's Fund did a survey of so-called health and well-being boards of local government, asking them what their priorities were. And the number one was Marmot principles. Three quarters of local authorities are implementing my report so much so. I met a local government person from Manchester, not in health, and she said, Marmot, oh, I didn't realize you were a person. We, <laughs> we talk about implementing Marmot. <laughs> And as I'm sure you know, we've got the Malmo Commission. We're going to have a report from Öster Gotland. Gothenburg's been very interested. The Swedish Association of Local Authorities and Regions has really taken this on. Madam Chair is about to kick me off the platform if I don't stop in a moment. But I want to show you one last thing. I've been working closely with Harry Burns, who's the Chief Medical Officer for Scotland. And he compared mortality in Scotland with Manchester and Liverpool. Three cities, post-industrial cities, manufacturing decline, similar levels of poverty, similar levels of income inequality. But Glasgow has higher mortality than Liverpool and Manchester. Look at the causes of death that show the biggest relative excess in Glasgow. Drug-related poisoning, alcohol, suicide, and external causes. They're all psychosocial. And Harry Burns says a major element of the excess risk of premature death is psychosocially determined. People have little control over their lives. And I've said we need to put at the heart of our social actions to reduce health inequalities, empowering people, creating the conditions for people to have control over their lives. And I'm grateful to Ole Lundberg for this phrase that we said at the conclusion of our European review, if you're doing very little on social determinants, do something. If you're doing something, do more. And if you're Sweden and you're doing a lot, do it better. Thank you.